much. Thanks, Sam. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope you're all well. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you for the uh, introduction, Sam and Artie. Uh, yeah, I'm a, a planning consultant. I also have a background um, as a, I was a planning uh, a property agent for a while, an office agency, and I was also in valuation for a while. So I've been in, uh, in different aspects of the property business. Um, I've also, also been a lawyer, um, both for councils and um, uh, for private clients as well. So uh, various different guys as I've been involved in property over the last 20 or so years. And we've been running uh, DRK planning for last, uh, just over the last 10 years. Seen a lot of changes in that time. Uh, so we obviously uh, set up in the last recession and um, uh, plan to not only get through that one, but also get through this one quite successfully as well. And just a, an addendum on some of the thoughts that uh, we have uh, that we were sharing a moment ago on the state of the market. Yes, it's very difficult to predict at the moment, uh, not least because um, there seems to be a bit of a false mini property boom as a result of people being almost overjoyed at coming out of lockdown and uh, getting out there and being busy and wanting to catch up for lost time and uh, and bid for sites um, and some lenders um, holding to the terms that they were prepared to lend to before we went into lockdown but there's also as we get closer towards um, the October end of furlough a lot of nervousness about the position of possible end users and buyers of property as well and whether or not many will be able to uh, afford um, uh, the properties that are on the market, so on and so forth, um, once developers um, acquire and, and make change and so on, uh, and that sort of thing as well. So um, there's a, quite a lot of uh, developers and investors who are not quite rushing into the market just yet. And we are seeing that in some areas, particularly in London, that may uh, explain some of the reticence around the previous um, uh, callers. Um, experience and so we'll have to wait and see uh, what happens there. there's a lot of uncertainty uh, and um, people are up, I think they're waiting to see what will happen with with values and prices it's very difficult to predict at the moment so in terms of um, where we are with planning at the moment we've seen uh, a number of new permitted development rights come into the arena we're going to go through those in detail but in terms of uh, just a general general summary we have uh, new PD rights in relation to knocking down and rebuilding offices and flats and putting up a new building, a uh, slightly taller or slightly bigger building on the same site. Also extending buildings, uh, ex existing buildings. Um, so putting another one or two stories on them, depending upon whether or not they're in mixed use or whether or not they are um, just houses or, or flats, uh, whether or not they're detached or terrace or purpose-built flats as well. And then we've seen changes to the existing PD rights or prior approval rights around offices to resi, retail to resi and so on and so forth with uh, primarily an extra constraint of the need for adequate natural light to habitable rooms as well as other constraints that already exist such as parking and highways, uh, flood risk, contamination and noise. And along with that comes the need to submit further information and further plans such as elevations and not just a bare site plan or bare, loca uh, bare location plan, uh, just showing the outline of the, the rooms. You also have to show where the habitable rooms will be in those units. Um, there've also been changes to the use classes order as well. Uh, and we'll go through that in more detail uh, very soon. And also changes around the time for implementation of planning permission as well. There are a lot of people who have been concerned that their planning permissions might expire because of lockdown, they wouldn't be able to get on site they wouldn't be able to start to implement their planning permissions or planning applications and, and, and save them. And therefore, the government introduced legislation on a temporary basis to help people to overcome those problems. And that's where we're going to begin. So just very briefly, um, there are two main differences between uh, planning applications or, um, or applications which are granted full planning permission and prior approvals. So if you have an application for planning permission, uh, and you get a planning permission through, then you don't have very much to do to have to save that. Bar discharging some of the conditions first that you may have to do before you can start on site, and those are called pre-commencement conditions. They're usually phrased as no development shall begin until. Um, so you have to 
then only probably just dig a, a trench or dig a, dig a hole in the ground roughly where the foundations are and then you've saved your planning permission you don't have to do any further work on that with a prior approval it's a slightly different ball game uh, so for instance with a change of use uh, in order to save that change of use and stop it from expiring the change of use doesn't actually occur until you've done a lot more work you actually have to change that use so you'll have to do all the refurbishment or renovation works um, you don't necessarily have to move people in but you have to get it to a point where it's ready for usable occupation that usually means past the point of practical completion certainly past first fixings and se second fixings and it's ready for people to move in and to use so with a prior approval, you've got a lot more work to do and you're a lot more at risk in terms of time scale if you're a little bit fur quite a bit further off in terms of saving that as a consent. Uh, now that's worth bearing in mind because when the government brought in new legislation earlier this year to try to help developers out and say, okay, you're not being able to make a start on site to save um, your consents, we're going to give you an automatic extension to next May, 1st of May, um, it did not include prior approvals for some reason. So it included extensions on outline planning permissions, full planning permissions and listed building consent, but not outline and not on prior approvals uh, more, and mere change of use applications. So those were sort of left out. So what do you do in those sorts of situations? Well, if you've got a benefit of a planning permission, then you're automatically extended to the 1st of May 2021. If your planning permission was due to expire between the 19th of August 2020 and the end of this year. If it was due to expire earlier than that, so between lockdown, 23rd of March and the 19th of August, then you get the same right of extension, but you have to fill out some, a, a few more forms and provide a little bit more information. And that's what's called an additional environmental approval. It's quite straightforward. There is guidance on it, but seek professional help on that. With a prior approval or a planning permission, you can always extend by just applying for the same thing again and getting that granted and that always gives you another three years but you may not be able to do that in some cases so for instance uh, if you're applying for planning permission you may not be able to do it because the policy may have changed um, and if the policy has changed against you then it's safer to rely on what you have got and therefore then rely upon the automatic extension given by law if you've got a prior approval um, and there's been an Article 4 direction made in the meantime, then you can't apply for the prior approval again unless there's some sort of um, clause in the Article 4 direction that's been made that allows you to do that. But normally, um, you can't apply for a, a fresh prior approval again. So your only option in that case, if it's a prior approval, is to get on and do the works as quickly as you can and probably keep shtum about it in the meantime. Um, and there has been... Um, uh, there, have, there have been some further concessions and freedoms granted to developers to extend their working construction working hours as well. Uh, so there is guidance on that. I'll again, seek professional help on that. But why is this important? Because the reason it's important is because you may have land that you're trying to sell which benefits from planning permission or prior approval. So you want to be able to maximise the profit and the, um, the value on that. So you need to know where you stand as far as whether or not that planning permission is saved or it will continue to exist. Um, sorry about that. So, um, and um, if um, uh, if it's a prior approval, then um, you also need to know whether or not it's uh, going to expire. Uh, and if it's going to expire and there's an Article 4 direction, uh, you need to know that you might need to crack on and get those works done so you, you can save that prior approval and still sell the land on with the benefits of the prior approval. Um, if uh, automa Also, if you are buying land um, and that land benefits from planning permission or prior approval, uh, then again, uh, you need to know whether or not that planning permission is so something that you will still benefit from after you've paid that enhanced value, similarly with prior approval. Otherwise, if it's due to expire or likely to expire, then that might, might be a potential negotiation point with the vendor. So um, hopefully that's, that's nice and clear, but it's, it's quite fundamental as well and often overlooked as either a, a risk to those who have got sites that they're looking to sell with the benefit of planning permission or prior approval, 
or an opportunity for those who are looking to buy sites which have a planning permission or a prior approval. So we're going to now look through the, um, the PDs that have been granted recently for um, extensions on buildings. And the first one to start off with is the first one that was introduced, uh, and that is on detached purpose-built blocks of flats. So you'll probably be looking for a building, something like this on the right-hand side. Um, it has to be at least three stories in height. That's three full stories. So if it was if that picture on the right-hand side was two stories, plus a roof and it had accommodation in the roof, the accommodation in the roof doesn't count as a story. So that building would not then count. It would have to be three full stories. It has to have been purpose built as flat. So not a building that's been converted by prior approval or by planning permission as flat to flats. And it has to have been completed as a building um, between the 1st of July, 1948, which is when the modern day planning system came into being and the 5th of March, 2018, which is, when the, um, when the right was first announced to the House of Commons by the Minister. Uh, and you can go up to 30 metres, with the, it's including the extra floors, um, and uh, that will take you up to about probably about eight or nine storeys in total. Uh, as you'll see from point eight, and to a certain extent, nine, <coughs> nine and ten um, below, that there are a number of conditions and restraints um, to this, which we'll come into further detail, but um, you'll need to be able to prove that there's no overlooking to your neighbors, there's no loss of privacy to them, uh, there's no loss of light to them, uh, and that the development or the proposed extra stories would not be harmful in terms of their external appearance. Now, external appearance is not very widely defined, and it is subjective, and there isn't any guidance on this. So I can expect that there's going to be an awful lot of caution by councils who are looking to resist these sorts of proposals. And likewise, there's going to be a fair bit of risk for developers uh, in putting these proposals forward as well. Ideally, you should be looking for sites which have parking spaces on the site, which are free. You don't have to um, play musical chairs or rejig the parking layouts because you might not be able to get permission from existing occupiers or tenants to do so because they often will have a right to use those specific parking spaces written into their leases or at the very least if you're not going to rely on providing new car spaces off street for the particular new unit then you'll need to rely on a really good public transport system and public accessibility to tran public transport uh, locally as well uh, because it also includes the possibility to provide structures on the site for enhanced bin storage and bike storage then flood zone impact is relevant uh, and so generally speaking it's best to look in areas which are only flood zone one but if you're in flood zone two or three that doesn't necessarily cause a problem because the actual living accommodation is not going to be or additional living accommodation is not going to be at that level and from an external appearance point of view, sometimes it's easy to deal with it, to deal with a building which has a flat roof on it. And then if for, it doesn't look particularly odd or strange in external appearance terms to put another roof on there. If it's got a pitched roof, then you'll probably have to look at taking that pitched roof off and then putting full stories um, on it instead. Now, if it's not purpose built, then you might go for uh, a building which has been converted uh, by planning permission or by prior approval. But the only way you can do that with a building which was not purpose built, say for instance, if we were looking at the building beforehand and this was purpose built as a block of, not purpose built block of flats, but it was converted to flats, then what you would need to do is you would need to uh, treat it as this type of PD. Uh, whereby you'll need to include a uh, probably a retail use on the ground floor in one of the units. So it becomes a detached mixed use building. Uh, it's the only way of making sure that non-purpose built blocks of flats, uh, so that's blocks of flats which are not purpose built but they were converted to flats, they could benefit from these PD rights. So you'll need to make sure that there's a 
uh, a commercial unit on the ground floor. So typically this kind of PD right would apply to shopping parades, for instance, where you see retail on the ground floor and you see residential uppers. And the retail on the ground floor can only fall into various particular uses. So it can only fall in A1, A2, A3. So that's all the uh, primary shopping uses. Uh, that's retail, financial and professional restaurants, B1 offices, betting shops, payday loan shops, and laundrettes. If it's anything else, such as a dental clinic, homeopathy, a gym, or something like that, then you will not be able to convert the, or put uh, an additional story on top of the building or that part of the building, which is, which has a ground floor, which is, or, or any part of the building in use as one of those non-conforming commercial uses. So if you have that sort of situation, you need to look at perhaps uh, changing the use of the commercial premises into one of those, which I've just mentioned, mentioned. So a shop, restaurant, betting shop, laundrette, B1 office, for instance, and you could use the freedoms in some cases of the use classes order to do, to do that. So because of the new use classes order, for instance, you've got gyms uh, and you've got dental clinics, which um, are not included within the mixed use categories here, but they are fall within the same use classes order as B1 office or shops and restaurants. So you might then look to change that non-conforming um, commercial use, uh, which is in that mixed use building into uh, one of the conforming ones by using the new class E. Doesn't require planning permission. Uh, I probably get a certificate of lawfulness for it in any event, uh, but um, it should be fairly straightforward. And then you've acquired the right to put the extra stories on top as well. Again, like the other one that we've just shown, it's a minimum of three stories, not in conservation areas, not listed buildings and the dates the building has to be constructed in the same. So for instance, if there have been extensions already to the building, um, you're sometimes not allowed to go for these extra rights in any event. But if there have been changes to the building otherwise, other than extensions, uh, that doesn't necessarily create a problem uh, for using this particular PD right. Uh, it's, the, it's the fact that the building was constructed uh, in those times. So there may have been changes of use, um, in that building or part of that building several times in that period between 48 and 2018. But as long as the building was constructed between those dates, that's the main thing. Again, it's subject to very similar conditions and, and, and restraints as we've already referred to. It's worth noting that with none of these PDs, is there any sort of deemed prior approval provision? So for instance, if the council takes longer than 56 days, to determine any of these, then that period rolls on. And there's no automatic grant of permitted development as there is with office to resi and retail to resi, for instance. So generally speaking, that's what you probably might end up with. So you've got a three story building uh, under schedule two, part 20, class AA, uh, a new dwelling house on detached commercial or mixed use building. Uh, so imagine our, our new front elevation, and our front elevation on the ground floor probably has a commercial component to it and then you can put two new stories on there so you're possibly up to seven stories plus the two stories will take you roughly to 30 meters that's assuming that each um, story is roughly about three to three and a half meters in height uh, so hopefully that's clear and that note that note at the top right if it's purpose built you're just using a different schedule two part 19 class a instead of schedule two part 20 class aa if it's terrace um, mixed use building, sort of detached mixed use building, very similar again. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one of these conditions and restraints every time because there is a lot of uh, similarity between them. Um, but because um, you've got uh, mixed use buildings, uh, so wherever you have mixed use buildings, you have, often have to get noise uh, reports as well to show that there's going to be no disturbance to the new residential occupants from the commercial units below. But otherwise, in many other respects, it's very much the same, but the height limits are slightly different. So for instance, being able to go up to 30 meters is not the case here. You can go up to 18 meters on terrace buildings. And also it can't be more than three and a half meters above the height 
of the highest part of any other part of the terrace. So you can see that demonstrated on this graph. So um, this is where you'll use Schedule 2, Part 1, Class AA, for enlargement of a dwelling by construction or a terraced dwelling by constru construction of additional stories. Or if it's in mixed use, you'll use Schedule 2, Part 20, either Class AB, um, where it's a terrace which is in commercial or mixed use, or if it's a terrace of dwellings, um, you're using class AC. If you're only enlarging and not adding additional stories, you'll use Schedule 2, Part 1, Class AA. If you're adding additional stories as well as enlarging, then you'll use Schedule 2, Part 20, Class AB, if it's in mixed use already, or AC if there are no commercial uses in there at all. So you've got to be careful of a situation like this, for instance. So this is a terrace. So they all share party walls with each other. Uh, so if you look at the building, which is second from left, you'll see it's one story, well, two stories, um, plus a low pitched roof. Um, and if you're going to extend one of the um, buildings upwards to the right of that, um, that building cannot be extended any higher um, to such an extent that the ridge height effectively of the new roof um, would be more than three and a half meters above the ridge height of uh, the building to the left or sort of the the building second from left uh, so you can see how for instance if you have an exceptionally low building in the terrace it might pull down the potential to add stories on any part of the rest of the terrace because you have to measure that three and a half meters difference against the highest part of any other building in the terrace. So uh, it's best to find terraces ideally where they are relatively even in height already. Uh, so we've looked at terraced mixed um, use buildings. Um, what if there are no commercial units in there and it's only single dwelling? So the height limits are the same. It's just that we don't have to look for noise impact or, any, or, or restraint of commercial users nearby. So there's no noise reports required in this case, but otherwise they are very similar to what we've seen before in relation to um, terraced buildings which are in commercial or mixed use. Um, now, this is very much similar to the graph that we showed before. Let's flick through, show that. It's very similar to this. The only difference is that's a terrace of um, three building, well, three addresses or three buildings. In this case, this is effectively semi-detached. So just to, this is just to demonstrate the point that the legislation also allows you to extend on semi-detached buildings. So obviously there's going to be an issue here in terms of external appearance, because in any residential street where you have semi-detached buildings, it's going to look odd and it's going to cause possible harm to the street scene if you start extending buildings in this way. And so I should imagine that that's the kind of thing that councils will catch and use as a way of trying to resist the grant of permitted development in these cases. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of excitement around all of this, but in practical terms and in, in reality, you've got to pick your targets very carefully. And I would suggest that you probably won't find too many of these, if any of these at all, in normal residential streets where you've got pretty much an established pattern of development and established building heights. Now, if you've got detached single dwellings, there are similar things that you can do, obviously, if it's only one story, even if it's one story with a pitched roof, such as a bungalow, um, then you can only go up one story, but if it's two stories or two stories with a pitched roof, then you can go up two stories. Uh, and uh, the limitations, again, very similar. Again, you're, very sim you're similarly um, restricted in terms of height. Um, and this is very similar to that, but this is where you're looking for an enlargement, but not extra stories. So the one before, this is where you are looking for enlargement plus extra, plus extra units. This is an enlargement, but no extra units. So in terms of a, um, a house which has two storeys plus uh, a roof, might 
be it might look something like that where you might go up to 18 meters uh, and uh, you can't go any higher than seven meters if you're going two stories above or if it's one story above it's you can't go any higher than three and a half meters above the um, the existing house um, but if um, but you can go up to um, up to 18 meters in total and if it's single story instead uh, and your accommodation is just in the uh, pitched roof so it's a bungalow or chalet bungalow then you can go only one story higher but again you're still subject to that 18 meters rule uh, there are conditions in relation to um, making sure that there is no harm to neighbours in terms of natural light. Uh, and so when extending a building up, let's always be mindful of if you draw a 25 degree line from the centre of um, the nearest effective habitable, facing habitable room to neighbours, are you going to be breaching that line? If you are, then there's a presumption that you are going to cause a, la a loss of natural light to your neighbours. Um, that's not necessarily end game because you might be able to obtain a sunlight and daylight report that looks at it in much more detail and then concludes that actually there's not a problem. But this only tells it whether or not there is likely to be a problem and at the very least requires further detailed investigation. The other PD right that's been introduced recently is to knock down buildings uh, which are in B1 use or purpose-built, stress purpose-built blocks of flats. And in that case, um, uh, that could be quite useful, particularly if you've got a lot of office buildings which are subject to existing Article 4 directions where you can't convert them to residential under Class O of the GPDO. But um, at the moment, councils haven't brought in Article 4 directions to restrict this one, Class ZA. And uh, this is particularly useful because what you would be able to do is you would be able to only, you only need to show that the building's been vacant for at least six months prior to the application. So in, if you didn't have the opportunity to use article, art, if you didn't have the opportunity to use prior approval, then you would be able to um, make an application for planning permission, but you'd probably have to market the building for a good 12, maybe 18 months, depending upon the council's policies before you can establish a principle in favor of change of use. This gets around all of that, it means that you don't have to take that risk for 12 to 18 months and market it for that period of time. You only have to show that the building's been vacant for at least six months. So it's particularly useful here. Um, it is subject to buildings which uh, do not exceed a thousand square meters in footprint. Uh, and the building only has to have been built um, before the 1st of January 1990. So more recent buildings won't, be, won't benefit from this. Again, it's subject to a set to an 18 metre height, but there are more complicating factors around how high you can build a building and only how high you can build parts of the building as well. So for instance, um, you can only go two storeys, um, or you can only go seven metres above, um, the old building or any part of the old building and that basically means that if your building profile changes from one two or three to to one two to three stories then you probably have to follow that building profile in terms of your additional height uh, rather than go all out with um, a, a consistent 18 meter height all the way across because you'll have some parts of the building which will be seven more than seven meters above where the corresponding part of that old building was, uh, particularly if that other part of the old building was much lower. So if you've got a difference in roof profile or height profile uh, to a building, you'll probably have to follow that profile in order to keep within the limits. So some practical points around this, obviously you can see we've got to match the right PD to the right opportunity. The age of the building is one of the factors that I'm often asked about how do you check that. So there is a website called Old Maps, which a lot of people have been using, Old Maps. I think it's old-maps.co.uk and that, will, that gives you an indication of when buildings may have been built. It gives you a selection of old maps you can choose from, uh, covering certain periods in history, and then 
you can see whether or not you're building features there. Uh, you can um, structurally in, uh, enforce buildings as a part of the PD exercise, uh, but obviously you can see challenges around the number of extra stories that you can get, or whether or not you can build them uh, on the uh, sites in the first place. With these extra stories, then if structural integrity is an issue, you also have to worry, because you'll have to consider whether or not you can get access within the building to reinforce it in any event, because you can't sort of propose something where you're putting a kind of structural exoskeleton on it to reinforce it. You have to make those structural changes in a way that doesn't change the, internal, the external appearance of the building. And that can be particularly challenging, for instance, if you have got a building which is otherwise fully occupied or partly occupied and being able to get access to do those structural works. So there may be an opportunity there for lightweight or modular construction. We've already touched on the fact that design and external appearance is a very subjective area. So that's a possible risk and unknown to this. And for that reason, it may not work in many areas. And also we've seen how there are a number of conditions and restrictions around this, around, for instance, contamination, flood risk, highways, parking, and noise. And therefore you need to be considering about building a team of experts around you. Now, it is a new area of law, and you can imagine with all new areas of law, particularly areas where councils are not particularly keen on extending PD rights, there's going to be some legal argument. So for instance, if you have sloping ground, either left to right or back to front across the building, where do you measure the ground level from in order to determine whether or not you're breaching the 30 meters or the 18 meters ultimate height? Uh, so uh, there is no guidance on that. So I think the short answer is you choose it from the level of the ground which best suits your argument and gives you the most uh, extra floor extra floor space or extra uh, stories uh, that suits you. I mean another area for instance is for instance with the redevelopment of office buildings or purpose-built blocks of flats you can't do that on buildings which are any larger than a thousand square meters in footprint. Well what happens if you have a building which has an undercroft? Then if you have an undercroft I possibly the undercroft doesn't count as footprint because it's not touching the ground uh, as far as the undercroft is concerned. So if you have a building which is maybe 1,080 square metres in, um, in floor area, on the ground area, including the undercroft, but it's um, 80 square metres of undercroft, then you could probably take that 80 square metres of undercroft off and that brings you within your threshold in terms of footprint. So you can probably get around it in that way. Now the planning fees are not going to be as cheap as the prior approval fees that we've all been used to. So we're all used to paying about 96 pounds for our office to resi conversions, no matter how many, um, we, uh, how many units we are proposing. So the, the planning fees for this will be much more into the thousands or tens of thousands, depending upon how many extra units that you're okay. applying for. Okay, De David. Yes. Round up, please. Yeah, I think this is so exciting, uh, and I, I got carried away uh, enjoying it. So uh, we just gonna round up, and then we can continue on the Q and A panel. Okay, let me just finish this slide, please. Okay. Um, so, uh, so planning fees can be very, very expensive, and parking rights. Uh, again, we've already touched on. You don't, you don't want to be um, proposing this in areas which are um, deficient in car parking, particularly on sites which are deficient in car parking. Uh, building regulations and fire safety, obviously you'll need to take that into account. Uh, and uh, there is some indication that with sprinkler systems, you may have to fit existing uh, units with um, new sprinkler systems if you're proposing these new uh, PD rights, uh, because uh, the law is being changed around that uh, as a response to the Grenfell inquiry. Article 4 directions have not come in yet for many of these and probably won't come in for a number of months. Uh, so uh, that's just kind of just to wrap up on, on those uh, points. There's quite a bit more that uh, was going to cover um, in terms of, for instance, use classes order, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, happy to take questions on the use classes order and some of these other points um, further on. Um, but uh, Sam, if yes. you want me to wrap up there. Sorry, I didn't realize um, Thank you. Oh, the time uh, we're is so short of time. Uh, we are, I'm 
personally enjoying it actually um it's been uh a fantastic uh, presentation, David. Thank you. And by the way, just for, uh, for, for I mean, we have so many questions in the Q and A box. Please put your questions in there, and David will start going through them quite soon during the Q and A. Um, property question time is always a much shorter window of opportunity to actually be able to um, uh, present as much as we would have liked David to. Um, David, are we doing the evening event in, in November? Uh, I believe. Yeah. So. Um, November is it twelfth? Yeah, on November twelfth in the evening, we we are putting on an event, a Midas event with David, which David would be the only speaker that evening, and David can do a ninety minutes presentation on the whole opportunity. So that evening, yes. David yeah. should have enough time to actually uh, present uninterrupted because I, I I love what you've been presenting so far. Um, I, I just got um. Really yeah, I think intimate. probably the best thing is if I do the same presentation again, but cover the rest of it on that 90 minute presentation. I think it's also quite timely because one thing I'd just like to say is that um, all these new PD rights and the new use classes or order changes, they're all subject to a court case, which is going to the high court. On, uh, we don't know yet which day, but it'll be sometime between the week of the Thursday, the 8th of October and Thursday, the 15th of October. Um, so there is a challenge against the government's new PD rights and use classes order, and we don't know what will happen out of that. We don't know whether or not it's going, they're going, who's going to win, who's going to lose, if it's going to go to the Supreme Court, how quickly it will be resolved. So hopefully by the time we all meet together in November, we'll have some clearer answers and clearer direction. But Sam, if I may just add one more point, I just want Absolutely. to make this, this point very, because it's, it's something that's come up quite a lot. Um, I've heard some commentators say that the changes to the use classes order, which are very, very useful, um, mm -hmm. they're ending on the 31st of July, or plan to end on the 31st of July next year. That's correct. But I've also heard some say the new prior approval, or the current prior approvals, office to resi, retail to resi, they will also come to an end on that date. That is not correct. The law only provides at the moment for the new use classes order to end automatically that is if the government does nothing else in the meantime to change that on the 31st of July. And actually there's quite a lot of indication in the um, new planning reform uh, legislation that they intend to carry on those existing prior approval rights and possibly, but they haven't said how or, or where or in what way to extend prior approval to other areas of development as well. So you know, we have to watch that space, but I wanna make that very clear. Office to Resi, prior approval and retail to resi prior approval is going to carry on as normal uh, no change in the meantime okay fantastic 